Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John, this is Benny, a true nerd, and welcome to Thrones of Britannia, a Total War Saga. No, really, I know right now you're just looking at, like, what looks like concept art, but I've actually got my hands on it. See? No, nope, back off, back to the concept art now. Right, the reason you're looking at concept art right now is I have indeed managed to get my hands on this, like, a month early, which is flipping amazing, but that comes with certain limitations on what I'm allowed to show you. I can show you half an hour of Thrones of Britannia over three videos where I can show you ten minutes of footage. But this isn't footage. This is clearly concept art. So therefore it's fine. So I didn't want to kind of, you know, do the intro over just like, you know, the title screen or whatever. Because that would be a waste of time. So yes, I've got Thrones of Britannia a month early or thereabouts. Ooh. Oh, I'm thrilled. Right, so I basically had a weekend to play this, so I've put about 12 hours into this so far, just kind of getting to grips with it. I've been enjoying it a lot, and now I get to show you a bit of it. I can't show you the beginning of a campaign, however. What I can show you is kind of like the mid-game onwards. So what I'm going to leap into is one of the campaigns I've actually been playing through, and you'll be joining me at turn 50, and I'm going to introduce you to our empire. So welcome to Wales, because I'm playing as the Welsh Kingdom of, as you can see down there, Gwyneth. That's because the way Welsh works is you basically take the letters in the word and you don't pronounce any of them, you pronounce some entirely different letters for no well-explained reason. In fact, the best way to introduce my faction is probably to go into the really rather gorgeous strategic map up here. So basically, everything in white belongs to me. Uh, I started off up here, and then I expanded into English territory, heading further and further south. The guy who's kind of weirdly close to me is actually one of my Welsh allies. My armies, meanwhile, are down here. I've got my main army over here, down in South Wales, and my other army down here. But as a result, we now have a border with the biggest English kingdom going, the actual Anglo-Saxons. We're not at war with them yet, but they hate us and we hate them, so it's kind of a matter of time, which is why I've got one of my armies down here. Now, you may immediately notice that I've got basically no armies up north anywhere. Like, literally, the entirety of this bit of my empire is undefended. For example, this area, these kind of four towns here, this is one province with mighty, mighty Tamworth. <laughs> I grew up not far from Tamworth. The idea of Tamworth as a mighty fortified economic and cultural centre is ridiculous, but never mind. Tamworth is the capital. That gets walls and a nice big garrison. However, these other three towns that make up this province, Lichfield, Stafford and... I'm guessing that's ancient Stockport, given it's south of Manchester, or Mainchester. Uh, but yeah, these guys have no walls and no garrison. So why am I not worried about these bastards next door basically coming in and taking them? Well, you see, my actual heartland is over here. That's my actual capital. These territories are protected from incursion from this direction, because we've got Chester here. Chester is not just a big walled city. Chester is also an ancient Roman city. So as a result, if we go over here, it's got Roman walls. Big, tough stone walls, stone gate houses, and it blocks up the bridge. And as for the south, these are actually other Welsh territories. So as a result, we should be pretty much okay with them. Because diplomacy in this game basically depends on you understanding three ideas. One, everyone's got a cultural identity and they tend to like people of their own culture. Two, my enemy's enemy is my friend. So these guys up here are actually Vikings, and you guys are Vikings as well. But I've been at war with the English for quite some time. They don't like the English either, so therefore they're pretty cool with each other. Plus these guys up here in particular, the Northumbrians, they're a bit busy with their own wars right now. And the third and most important point, everybody hates the English. No, seriously, everyone hates the English. The English start off with a really big, rich territory. These Anglo-Saxons, like they're the red on this map over here. They own huge amounts of really rich, really valuable, really fertile land. So as a result, basically they're constantly being attacked from Vikings and Welsh people and raiders just spawn in on the scene, attack them. I'm not actually at war with anyone right now. And that means, because for the time being at least, yeah, the Anglo-Saxons aren't actually attacking me and I've got a good army guarding Gloucester down here, so hopefully they'll struggle to get in, because yeah, I've got almost a full stack army there that's currently kind of uh, just kind of healing itself, together with a good-sized garrison, because I actually built a special garrison here to increase the size of the garrison. They're going to struggle to break Gloucester, especially as Gloucester is also old Roman town. So as a result, there are good Roman walls here. Now that gives me a little bit of free time, which is lovely, because I think it's about time we thought about unifying Wales. And the Short Kingdom victory basically involves me controlling all five of the Welsh Kingdoms, or at least the five Welsh Kingdoms that are actually in Wales. There's actually another one up north. We don't need to worry about that one. So Powers, they're my bro allies. In fact, literally, they're my brother. In fact, hang on, let me show you the family tree. 
There he is, Merwin. He's my brother, and he actually is running powers. Technically, my brother also runs one of the other factions, but I don't like him quite as much. So, he basically needs to go down, because he never had the good foresight to actually form a military alliance with me. So, screw that guy. See, my brother, who's this guy in yellow here, has formed a defensive pact with these guys next door, who literally only own one territory. So, if I were to attack them, he might actually declare war on me, then it's not my fault, it's his fault, and we can have all his lovely land off him. So what do we know about this town? This here is not actually a provincial capital, it's a little subtown. Actually, yeah, this is one thing I really love about this game, the way towns work. So let me just uh, very quickly zoom out here. Basically, you see these little symbols? That's showing you what each town has. Because my problem with Warhammer 2 was some of the towns felt too similar. They just ended up all being basically the same once you had a good template that you liked down. Instead, all of these towns are unique. They've got their own unique thing in them. Let me give you an example, because Chester's a great example of this. So Chester doesn't have, say, like, you know, Governor's Villa up to Governor's Palace, up to Pro Consul's Palace, etc. Instead, its core building is a market, because it's a market town. So as a result, it helps trade around the entire empire, and it provides a plus 15% bonus to all income from market buildings, or just basically economic buildings in general. So this here charter fair I'm building right now will get me 500 gold a turn, and this place, yeah, currently 262, but if I upgrade it, that's up to 400. That's a big increase. This is a really big money-making problem. Province. This guy I'm planning to attack, however, has something very important. He's got a farm. You see, food doesn't turn population growth and population points anymore. Those are just gone. You can upgrade your cities up to the next level whenever you've got the money to pay for it. Instead, food is now purely a function of how many armies you can actually maintain, as well as um, upper tier buildings as well. So for high tier advanced cities and for armies, you need food. And right now my food is at neutral. I'm losing food as fast as I'm making it. So I need to get some more in as soon as possible. Because right now that means I couldn't recruit a single extra unit without actually going into a food deficit. That causes famines. Your armies don't regenerate. It's terrible and you want to avoid it. So, let's send my nice army in over here and go and attack this guy. Yeah, I'm very happy to declare war on him. And would you believe, thanks to the fact that this guy is nice and upright, he'll almost certainly come to his allies' aid. In terms of my forces, the Welsh forces will be familiar to you if you played the Welsh faction in Medieval 2 Total Wars Kingdom expansion. They've not got the best infantry or cavalry, but where they really shine is in skirmishers and archers. So here's our battle map, and yeah, the battle maps are a bit more crowded than they used to be, which is very, very nice indeed. And the village itself is actually on the map, and can be useful for creating choke points. So I'm just going to send my army forward and let them take a little bit of fire on their front lines without a big deal. They're actually on the move at this point. They've come out to meet me. So my archers are now getting really good shots at these frontline guys. And they have started to, yeah, they've started to actually flank around the side here. So I'm going to redeploy some troops over here and get my cavalry ready to be involved as well. That's actually Welsh armoured axemen. Those are not nothing. That's interesting. Basically, I'm happy for this line to just hold here. We're just tearing their archers apart, their javelin men apart. I'd like to get some cav around the back, but actually, I might deploy my own general to go and do that. I'm just going to send my own general forward at this point. Now, where are the heavy axemen on this side? Yep, the heavy axemen are walking straight into my javelin guys who are short range, but they hit bloody hard. And this guy is, yeah, these Welsh armoured axemen are already wavering. You guys can get round here to start actually flinging into the side. They're shattered. My cavalry gets around the back. You guys just get over here and start hitting these guys. You guys get into the rear. Oh, those javelins. Those ja Look at that. Look at these guys now melt and they will break and that'll be the battle. So, this town falls to me. I could at this point basically hand it straight back to the guys I just beat on condition they become my vassals, but that's fine, I think we can do without that. Alternatively, I could sack it. It's actually been well developed, so there's a fair bit of money to be carried away. I actually want to occupy this place because it's got farmland, I want that for myself. So that faction ceased to exist and my food goes up from 0 to 88. But as we're about to begin a war, then we probably need to actually potentially get a little bit more money going on if we can. Because you see, taxation levels are conveniently back. So go into the economy over here. Right now my tax level is just normal. But my empire is looking pretty happy. So I imagine they can actually stomach a tax increase. Because right now, yeah, I'm going to have 2,400 gold. If I were to put taxes up to high... 
I'd have over 4,000 gold. And nobody goes into the red. Because now that I've actually got like 88 food, if I wanted to, I could train new units. Yeah, as a reminder, unit recruitment works differently now. Anytime you're in friendly territory, you can recruit anything that technologically you've unlocked. So if I wanted to, I could have one more unit of skirmishers. That would represent 150 gold up front that I can just afford. Together with 18 gold per turn. Yeah, skirmishes are really cheap for the Welsh. It's great. And I'd need to pay 10 food per turn in his upkeep. So basically, taking that farm has just awarded me the ability to have another 8 or 9 troops on the field. Food is going to be your big limiting factor. You can get money from anywhere. Food is difficult to come by. You absolutely want to take and hold farms. Uh, the other big change, of course, is when you recruit someone, they start weak and need to be allowed time to actually heal up. So battles really matter. One of the big problems in Warhammer 2 was, yeah, you had a big battle, but then even if you got completely wiped out, you're just like, yeah, I'll just train a new full stack army in two turns. No, 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 no. Now armies are recruited weak and uh, regeneration takes time to do. It's going to be six turns, assuming I'm even standing in a town in friendly territory before that guy actually gets up to speed. You can build buildings that actually speed up the regeneration, but they're not always the best buildings to have because those buildings won't be generating money or food. Except we've got a small problem. Apparently, we've got a little bit of a civil war to deal with just when I'd started a war. You know, ladies and gentlemen, how about we take care of that next time? Because I'm almost certain I'll be out of my 10 minutes at this point. So coming up today tomorrow, we will continue looking at Thrones of Britannia. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd. And this has been the beginning of my little preview playthrough of Total War Thrones of Britannia. Thank you very much, and goodbye. No, this this no, guy's no, enjoying no. that. This guy's enjoying his elephant a bit too much. In Fair Verona, we set our scene. Oh my god, Becky, look at her butt. It is so big. They've managed to glitch inside one of the buildings. Elephants in the rear! And then oh, in come the chariots! Yeah.